welcome. Uh, so today we're going to be talking uh, about an epic of typographic genius. Today's class is all about type. Um, so we're going to start really in the late 1600s and work forward from there uh, and really talk about how type had expanded and contracted. And again, we look at this class and we see that there is a movement that grows and grows and grows, but then there's a revolt and it comes back and kind of revolts against that and condenses into something uh, a little more peculiar. So let's start in um, around 1600. So in the 1600s, there was really a drought of graphic design. It was something that uh, graphic design had kind of taken a back seat to everything else, especially type had kind of not become an important thing. But moving into the late 1600s, early 1700s, there was kind of a resurgence of type. This was a real time that type found its footing and typography became something that was important and something that was a part of the everyday life uh, and something that was wanted by kings and really valued by the general public. So let's start in 1692. So 1692, um, King Louis the 14th had a strong interest in printing and he wanted a typeface that was just his own. He wanted a typeface that would be used specifically for being printed by, for royal things. So it's called the, the Imperie Royale, which was basically the royal printing, right? The royal printing office. And he wanted a typeface that was specifically designed and engineered based on scientific principles. He wanted to create the best letters that had ever been constructed. So to do this, uh, they constructed a grid system, right? This grid was built on 64 little boxes, and each of those was divided into 36 smaller boxes. So it's a total of 2,304 tiny little squares. Now, when they started to build these letters on this grid and on these squares, it wasn't just something that was mechanical. It wasn't something that was just constructed because the designer felt that that's how it had to be. These designs were really finished by the eye. It was something that you'll hear in the design world that's basically optical uh, versus technical. So technical means that it that's the way that it should be. Technically, this letter should look like this. But doing something optically means that we need to tweak the height of the O just a little bit. So it's a little taller than the rest of the letters, so it still looks the same size because it has those curves. Right? So instead of it being a perfect circle, maybe the O was a little bit taller. So it was finished by the eye, not necessarily mechanically or technically. But the name of this typeface was the Romain de Roy. And the Romain de Roy was something that contrasted the thick and the thin strokes with a very, very sharp serif. Right? We saw something like this when we were looking at how the Romans were etching into... Um, the tablets and etching into marble, you'd see that little tight serif and that very distinct thick and thin, kind of the thick vertical stroke, right? And then the thin horizontal stroke was something that that line weight really varied in the Remain de Roy. And what that did is it gave each letter form perfect balance. Now this type was designed specifically for, right, the Royal Printing Office. And something that's interesting is this type and these letters in this system was only to be used by this office, and it was a capital offense if you used it somewhere else. What that basically means is they could kill you for using a font, right? So imagine now you're like, oh, um, I'm going to choose Times New Roman. Nope, you're dead. So it was a big deal when the Remain de Roy was released because the royal printing could only use it. And that way it was the first kind of, uh, one of the first type systems that you would see that you'd know, oh, this is definitely from the Royal Printing Office because it's printed in the Remain de Roy, right? There aren't a lot of companies that have their own specific fonts per se, but if you look at something like Nike, they're always using Futura Bold Ultra Condensed. And you'll see that again and again and again. And when you see it on a shirt that just says like, you know, hoops every day or something, you know that because it's in that typeface, it's from Nike. So this is really the beginning of that, of creating a brand and a voice using only type. So the Remainder Roy was something that was so well constructed and so perfect that it created a new ideal 
for um, for designers. Really, the engineer had replaced the designer. Instead of just making these letters and designing these letters, they needed to be constructed. They needed to be engineered. And it really changed the way that we look at any kind of typographic influence. So the next big style that was uh, kind of coming on the scene at this time was one of my favorites, and it is named the Rococo, Rococo uh, era. Uh, every time, if you watched Foster's Home for Imaginary Friends, there's a character on there, and all he says is Rococo. Uh, so you'll hear me say that a lot. But the Rococo era was kind of a revolt against this, uh, against the place we're moving out of, which was that woodblock printing, right? That everything was very structured, everything was very geometric, and they really wanted the freedom of creating things that were organic, that looked high-end, that were extremely embellished. And the Rococo era is all about embellishment, right? The Rococo era is known very well uh, for being around in the 1720s to the 1770s, and it's extremely intricate and known for its high level of excellence. Um, what will be on your quiz about this is that it's known for its S-curves and its C-curves. What that means is as you look at this, you'll see that there are a lot of curves, right? That there are not a lot of straight lines. Everything is kind of curving one way or the other. You'll see a lot of almost wave-like patterns. Uh, we call those S-curves and C-curves. An S-curve is just like an S where it loops one way and comes back the other. And a C-curve is kind of just that half circle. And you'll see that especially in this right um this right example, those S-curves and those C-curves. Very often, Rococo is asymmetrical, and so you'll see th something on the right that is very asymmetrical, doesn't really go together because they wanted to show, we spent a lot of time, this isn't symmetrical, we didn't just mirror it, we did every single detail. But then you'll see also on the left, sometimes it was symmetrical, but it would be ramped up to 11. The intricacy and the detail would be kind of turned up all the way, so that they could really, really want it to look regal and excellent and absolutely perfect uh, and really this lavish look. <coughs> Excuse me. So Rococo would often use light pastel colors to, to kind of color in these designs, but the majority of the time they used an ivory white, sometimes gold, to really show, again, this was the highest level of design. So we're going to talk uh, real quick about the uh, about uh, Fournier Lejeune, uh, and I'm really terrible at French, so bear with me. But in the 18th century, type measurement was extremely chaotic, right? So today we have this system, right, that's by points, right? You can have 12-point font is what you write your papers in, 12-point double-spaced, you know, whatever, no double spaces after the periods. But back then there wasn't a way to measure type, right? There's no way to really say, cool, this letter should be this tall or this wide. But each foundry had come up with their own way of doing sizes, right? So let's say that my foundry, right, that you're working for my foundry, and I say, hey, um, I need you to write a paper, um, and it needs to be in 15, uh, 15 banana scale. And you're like, how do I know what banana scale is when it comes to type? I'm used to working in points. That's how it was, is each of these foundries was creating their own size, and their own way of measuring system. So because of that, it was extremely, extremely chaotic in the early days uh, in the 18th century. And the methods used to measure type were all different. So uh, in the mid 1700s, Fournier Lejeune created a standardization of type, right? He published this first table of what he called proportions. And this book is a specimen book that really designated this is what type looks like. This is how we measure type. This is how we can all be on the same page to say, hey, this type is 12 points tall uh, or whatever it is. He really invented that system so that we could understand, oh, everywhere I go, I know how big a 12 point type is. So over a six year period, he kept designing and de designing and designing and created over 4,600 characters all by himself. Right? He became this prolific type designer because he was really designating this is what type should be. Now, something that's interesting is his variety of weights and wits as he started working with type. He really started this idea of creating a font family, 
right? There's a lot of fonts in the same world that were visually compatible and could kind of be mixed here and there, right? So we see this today with things like Helvetica. You'll see Helvetica Bold, Helvetica New, Helvetica Oblique, Helvetica Ultra Thin, Helvetica Ultra Thin Condensed, uh, Helvetica Black. So it's basically this idea of taking letter forms and then creating different versions of those letter forms. It creates a system, a font family, that really can be used interspersed with the other different types. So if you see this example, right, we have an oblique here, we have a bold, we have uh, kind of an all caps tall, and then we have this body copy, right? So this font family is something that can all be used intermingling, right? You use this pretty much every day, you'll see that you write something in bold or you write something in italics. Those are all parts of this system that he, that for you know, Fournier de Zune started to pioneer. He started to create this idea of a font family. So during this time, printing was became known as the artillery of the intellect, right? And it said that Le Jeune was providing the ammo of intellect. He was providing a way for people to print and to have these books and to understand this information. So he wouldn't just publish a little thing here and there. He would publish complete design systems and basically show people, this is how you use different styles. This is how you take a single typeface and you expand it to something that you could have never imagined with 10 different weights, with three different obliques. And this is how you can use them all together, right? He wanted to help people so that books that weren't just type kind of laid on a page. It was a full system that created something truly beautiful. So Lejeune planned on creating four volumes of his manual of typography, but he died after the second one. And that's the last we talk about him. Again, this class is kind of depressing. Some more people are going to die. Two more people are going to die in this lecture alone. So just prepare your little hearts. So um, because going back to the Rococo style real quick, sorry we're jumping around just a little bit. The Rococo style used a lot of free lines. And again, we're talking about these S curves and these C curves, and we've talked about this in class. The style that was used is not woodblock printing, right? We want these free forms, woodblocks, very geometric. The style that was used in this would be copper plate engraving. Remember, we talked about engraving on those copper plates. You ink it, you wipe away the ink, and then when you press it, you can have these very intricate free forms, uh, and it really lent itself to the Rococo style and created these very intricate curves, right? That you can see here, this is all about S curves and C curves, all about flourishes. You'll see this a lot in Jessica Hish's work. Jessica Hish is all about the Rococo style. Uh, another designer that works in this style is uh, Brian Steely, if you wanna look him up. Again, tons of swashes, tons of swooshes, really embracing this idea of the Rococo style. So moving on to our next typographic monument. So for over two and a half centuries, after the invention of movable type, after the invention, uh, really the perfection by Gutenberg, England would really look to uh, other places for typography and design leadership. Um, in England, there was a lot of religious persecution, censorship, government control. Uh, the government actually controlled the printing um, in England, and so it was hard for them to really become a place for graphic innovation, any kind of design or typography innovation. And so in 1660, right, so before we were talking about and kind of referenced that idea that England was in bad shape. So in 1660, Charles II demanded that the number of printers in England would be reduced to 20. And listen to this, by death or otherwise. So he literally, he, he demanded that all of the things, all the print shops that were open would be closed. And if they needed to, they could kill the printers so that there were only 20 printers that were controlled and censored by him. Right? So it wasn't a great time. But moving forward and past that a little bit, type design had to be imported from Holland uh, and other areas into England because, again, 20 printers, death or otherwise. And someone came from Holland that changed the face of typographic world as we know it. And his name was William Caslon, C-A-S-L-O-N, William Caslon. You probably have his fonts on your computer right now. 
So he started type design in 1720 and was met with immediate success, right? He was immediately a big deal. His first, um, his first commission and his first font was an Arabic font that was uh, for the Society of Promoting Christian Knowledge. And his second font, get this, 1722, followed up his first size of Caslon Old Style, right? And that's what you have on your computer probably is some kind of Caslon Old Style um, or even just Caslon. <coughs> Excuse me. And with this invention and this creation design of Caslon Old Style in 1722, his reputation was made. He was the king of type. And he reigns almost even today. There have been a lot of type designers that have come after him, but Caslon is the one that really changed, changed the fabric of what type looks like. And he really helped change history a bit too. We'll talk about that in a second. So for almost 60 years during that time, England specifically and exclusively used Caslon fonts in all of their printing. So our good friend Benjamin Franklin, right? We all know Benjamin Franklin. He's on the $100 bill. And he was an avid fan of Caslon, right? You don't think about this. You think about, oh, like, you know, Declaration of Independence, all that stuff, like, yay, America, 1776, hoorah, USA, USA, right? So... So think about this. So we're talking about 1776 is when, you know, we signed the Declaration of Independence, all that stuff. So Caslon Old Style was made in 1722 and used exclusively for the next 60 years, right? So that takes us to 1780s, which means that America is getting started as a nation. So Benjamin Franklin loved Caslon and loved this type and actually took it from England and started to introduce it to the American colonies, right? Which is really interesting. So he preferred it in printing, and he actually used Caslon Old Style in the official printing of the Declaration of Independence, right? So you never think about when I design a letter or when I make a font or whatever it is that I will be changing the course of world history as we know it. Caslon had no idea, but Benjamin Franklin was such a huge fan that he printed the Declaration of Independence in Caslon Old Style. So his type uh, owed its popularity to its extreme legibility. It was very sturdy. And it was comfortable and friendly to the eye. Again, we talked about those serifs, how you'll read the serifs and follow the serifs across the page. Caslon had those very chunky, very sharp serifs so that it could help you read. It was very, very easy to use. Caslon um, continued, and they actually have continued to function and create typefaces until the 1960s with some of his heirs and some of his sons. Um, he worked in traditional old style typography that we looked at. Again, that Roman style with those differing line weights, the soft horizontals, the thick verticals, and really those very sharp serifs. And that idea and that style started to become a little more popular and started to be explored uh, by another man by the name of John Baskerville. Baskerville. So John Baskerville was involved in every facet of the bookmaking process, right? He was known for being an absolute perfectionist, right? Let's say that he was like the Kanye of ancient type, right? Every note, every piece, every feature had to be absolutely perfect, right? And that's not just about his type, right? He would do things where he would work on the printing press. He would create new papers. He would divine, design and publish his own books. And he started to make this full system that he had complete control over. Now, he didn't start out in type design. He started out making um, hardware. He'd make frames, clock cases, candlesticks, trays, and he made a fortune doing that, right? So at the age of 44, he decided, you know what? I don't care about this. I don't care about industrial design. I want to return to my first love, the love of letters. And so he wanted to have control, again, of every single process, every single part of the printing process, right? He's like a, like an old timey Kanye again, old timey Kanye with type. So his letters had elegance and lightness that had never been seen before. He created, he controlled every single part of the process. He wanted it to be absolutely pure, absolutely beautiful. And so he was, and instead of, he, he was the one that kind of revolted against the Rococo style. And instead of doing these very large engraved pages, a lot of these S and C curves, he decided to print a purely typographic book. 
So his books were purely typographic. They used only type to convey that same elegance and that same level of perfection that Rococo was chasing after. Now, something you'll notice here is the kerning on these, right? And the, the tracking, really, in between all the letters. And what that is is that there's a lot of space between the letters. And spacing those letters out gives it a new form of elegance, a new form of perfection, and kind of like heightens it to a whole new level. And to maintain this quality, the majority of the time, he would reject the majority of the print run. He was such a perfectionist that he would reject, let's say, maybe like 60-70% of the print run because it had little imperfections, and he wanted it to be absolutely perfect. Now, Basquiat was a great typeface, and his work was amazing, but a lot of people were mad about it. A lot of people didn't like it, and they thought like, oh, that hurts my eyes, it's too regal, I can't look at it. And so... People were used to using Caslon for so long that they said, oh, why can't we just use Caslon? And so our good friend Benjamin Franklin, who is known to be quite the prankster, decided that he was going to play a trick on everyone, right? And what he would do is he would print, print out pages uh, in Baskerville, but at the top he would say, oh, this is a Caslon sheet. This is printed in Caslon. What do you guys think about this? And everyone said, oh, it's so beautiful. I love Caslon. It's, it's absolutely amazing. And then he would print Caslon and label it Baskerville. And he'd show it to people and say, oh, I have a headache. Oh, it's so terrible. Oh, I hate it so much. And then he would reveal to them, actually, it's, it's not where you think it is. And you just really, really liked Baskerville and said that you hate Caslon, right? So it really became this cultural thing where people started to hate Baskerville, even though it was an amazing typeface that actually was pretty easy to read. So during this time, also, um, outside of type, was the introduction to infographics, right? This was explored way, way before uh, this time, talking about uh, things like Cartesian coordinates, um, but we're, what we're really focused on uh, is during this time, again, in the 1700s, this principle that was explored of combining information and graphics, right? So the the person that really started to pioneer this it goes by the name of William Playfair, P-L-A-Y-F-A-I-R. And he would use statistical data and transform it into symbolic graphics, something that you could understand very quickly and that was very um, accessible when you looked at it as a graphic instead of looking at it as a spreadsheet, right? So Playfair was the first to introduce the divided circle diagram, which we know today as the pie chart. That's 100% on your quiz. William Playfair was the first to introduce the pie chart, and he's responsible for creating a whole new area of graphic design, right? A whole new section known as the infographic. The infographics were really, really big probably five or six years ago. They've kind of died off, um, but if you go to things like Good Magazine, you'll see these incredible infographics, and the whole idea is that you're taking a ton of information and really condensing it down to one simple easy to learn, easy to look at, easy to understand graphic. Instead of a spreadsheet of all this information, you make it very accessible and very easy to understand. So jumping back to type, we're gonna talk real quick about the modern style, and specifically the modern style in type. Um, and we're gonna talk specifically about one person working in the modern style, specifically in type. His name was Juan Batista Badoni. Uh, and you'll need to know at least his last name for your quiz, B-O-D-O-N-I, Bodoni. So Bodoni was born in northern Italy, and he started to um, design type and really create type in Rome. And he was growing there and learning there and under this amazing mentor that was helping him kind of grow as a designer, but his mentor committed suicide. It's number two, two person that's going to die in this in this class. We have one more. I bet you can guess who it is. Um, so he decided to leave uh, where he was, decided to go to England uh, and work with Baskerville. They were working at the same time. They saw they had similar styles. So on his journey, he was asked to become the private printer to Parma. Private printer to Parma. It's a good warm up for you. So he became the private printer to Parma. He accepted. And in 1790, the Vatican asked him to establish a new press in Rome. Right? He wanted to become the official printer for the Vatican, which is a huge honor. And he said, nah, I think I'm good. 
I'm, I'm, I'm good here. I'm not going to go there. And so he actually denied the Vatican so that he could stay in Parma. Um, the revolt of this idea, uh, the revolt against Rococo was kind of beginning, kind of started with Bodoni. He wanted to fight against the lush designs that were popular during the Rococo era and start something new, start something modern, the modern style. That was an excellent segue. And so all of the areas of design required a new approach, new approach to kind of get rid of the Rococo style. It was so prolific, it was everywhere that Bodoni thought, I need to completely design a new system to create something that's so different from the Rococo style. And he led the way in evolving new typefaces and creating new and interesting page layouts. The modern style can be defined this way when you're looking at it visually, right? So it has serifs, but they're very straight serifs, right? The serifs we looked at before are those Roman serifs that are kind of gradual. The modern style has very straight serifs. They're very narrow, uh, and a lot of the letter forms feel condensed. They feel squished either horizontally or vertically. They have a lighter typographic tone, uh, and they feel very regal, right? When you look at typefaces from the modern style, um, in my brain, I always imagine them on like a macaroon box or some kind of like fine chocolate or a fine wine. The modern style is something that is kind of elevated to a whole nother level, and it does that through that extreme difference in the line weight, right? We look here and we see those extreme thick vertical strokes and those really, really tiny, really thin horizontal strokes. So that's how you kind of can define the modern style visually. So let's go back to Bodoni and talk about him. So 1790, let's start there. He reinvented the serif, right? We talked about this just a second ago that the modern style is known for this hairline uh, serif that's really a right angle instead of that gradual curve. And Bodoni reinvented the serif by making them those hairlines. He also defined uh, his design ideal and the way he approached design as clean, in good taste, with charm and regularity, right? He thought very highly of himself. And he designed it, he decided that that when he created a typeface, that letters shouldn't all be different. They should be combinations of each other that are combined from very limited and identical units, right? So What's interesting is when you kind of start out creating a typeface, we talked about this before in the geometric that you start with a triangle, a circle, a square. So he would do things like he would start with the H, right? So he'd start with an H, and then maybe from the H he would make the O, right? And then if you look here, the D is literally half of the H and half of the O, right? So you'd see that he didn't want them to be each unique. He wanted it to be a system of little pieces that you could put together, very simplified, um, and very kind of interchangeable. So in his layouts, he would kind of not have a lot of ornaments, not a lot of extra embellishments, and he would want something that was economic, that it had excellent form, that it was efficient, and that it had perfect function. The vast majority of books at this time um, were really reprints and renew editions of the Greek and Roman classics, right? So, which is perfect for him taking this Roman style and this Roman serif and completely reinventing it for a new era. So he designed about 300 typefaces, and he was going to make this huge specimen book that was really his life's work of all of his 300 typefaces, but then he died. Number three. That's it for this class. He's dead. So he died, didn't get to complete his life's work, but his wife and his assistant continued, continued to forge forward to create this book of his work, and in 1818, he published the Manual of Type, right? It was his his life's work, really, showing this is all that I've done. These are all these amazing typefaces. So he was so renowned that by 1872, the citizens um, of the citizens of uh, the area that he had been living and really working decided to erect a statue to Bodoni. Unfortunately, this statue had a nice engraving on it that said Bodoni, and. Uh, out of the 300 typefaces that he created in his life, out of this new modern style that he had created and really explored the new ventures of type, they didn't use any of his typefaces on his inscription. They made it in old style Roman letters, right? Which probably would kill Bodoni. He's probably rolling over in his grave knowing that that exists. So 
he actually thought that his work in the modern style was so amazing and so perfect and so refined that it wasn't intended for the common reader, right? He thought it was something that was this high thing that you can't just like go buy my book off a shelf. You need to be a king or queen to have this amazing, beautiful, luscious type, right? So moving forward out of the modern style, we'll see again and again that as the machine started to come on the scene, as there was a revolution in France, all aspects of the human experience started to change. We had to think about how we would visually communicate differently, how we grab people's attention. The Rococo style was out, the modern style was in, and we were moving to something that was brand new. That thing that was brand new is on the horizon, and more changes were to come. It was the time for the Industrial Revolution. And we'll cover that in our next lecture uh, when you pick up and watch that. So the Industrial Revolution, as we move into that, is one of my favorite chapters. So what I want you guys to do is when you're on Blackboard with this lecture, there are two links. And I want you to look at those links. Uh, there's one that is a video um, from uh, Marianne ban Banchales. I'm really terrible with her name, uh, but I want you to see that the Rococo style is something that isn't just reserved for kings and queens. It isn't just a high style. It's something that can be brought down to a level. And the, and the example that we're using uh, that you need to watch on Blackboard, macaroni art. She takes Rococo and makes it macaroni art. So it's absolutely amazing. Um, watch that TED Talk. Uh, it's very, very inspiring, and hopefully you guys can grab something from that, and we'll talk about that uh, in class. Um, other than that, I hope you guys uh, have a great week. Be sure to check out uh, any other assignments that are on Blackboard and be sure to do your quiz for this chapter. Thanks so much for tuning in uh, and I'll see you guys soon. Bye.